I've looked forward to spending time with you this evening to look over the book of Hosea. And um, I, I must say, I really appreciate the preaching this morning from Kyle Frazee. If you didn't get a chance to be there for that, I, I really encourage you to go and listen because it's really a bookend in a, of sorts to what we're going to look at tonight. This morning, Kyle looked at Psalm 78 and gave us a, a roadmap uh, for, for generational fidelity to the Lord. And, and tonight, we're going to look at the book of Hosea, and we're going to see what happens when those disciplines of training the next generation don't happen. So here's a game plan for tonight. Hosea follows a pretty straightforward outline. You've got chapters 1 through 3, which uh, covers the biography of Hosea's life, and then chapters 4 through 14, which is the proper indictment on Israel and all that that contains. And so there's just so many ways we can come at this book. And so what I tried to do um, as an objective so that when you go back to your study and read the book of Hosea, you can identify the things uh, that are really important to the book. And there's so many, how do you boil them down? Well, I've tried to boil them down to an outline of uh, a few categories. We can go ahead and put that first slide up. The first thing we're gonna do is just get acquainted with the big picture of Hosea by way of introduction and just to see what's happening in this book. And then we'll look at Hosea's commission as a prophet and why God chooses to convey the contents of the book through the paradigm of Hosea's biography to Israel. And then we'll examine the apostate generation that Hosea preached to and lived with. And finally, we'll discuss the ingredients of genuine repentance as Hosea presents them. I'm, I'm hopeful we'll get through all of those. Those are the categories I would love for you to look for as you read this wonderful book. Uh, so let me just go ahead and open us in prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, you are so gracious to preserve your word for us. Lord, you are a God who keeps his promises. And I pray that we would bank our lives on those promises. I pray that as we look into the future, as we look and think even generationally, that we would do all that we can so that the next generation that comes after us is equipped with your word, Lord. We love you. Please bless tonight's preaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a theory on, on Mark Twain quotes. I've got a theory on Mark Twain quotes. I have seen so many Mark Twain quotes that are unsighted that I'm not sure that all that he gets credit for he actually said. But I do have a favorite one. It goes like this. It ain't what you know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And, and I like that quote. It's by Mark Twain, maybe. I, I like the quote, and it comes to mind because it describes, in one, it describes the one word that I think characterizes the generation that Hosea preached to. And that word is presumption. Presumption. Hosea's generation was a presumptuous generation. Presumption is when you are convinced that something is true or permissible on the basis of some other independent truth. So, for example, if I said, God is good, he's full of mercy, he forgives, therefore, I can live life however I want. That would be presumptuous. I would be presuming on God's character. Now, the main point of Hosea is that God keeps his promises, which is quite amazing because he has grounds to break them in the face of every reason to give up on his people. But the generation that Hosea lived in presumed on those promises. They, they latched on to the positive ones of prosperity and, 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 uh, and goodness and future things, and they forgot about the promises of consequence, terrible things that would happen if they did not follow his law, his instruction. And the, the main exhortation of this book is to return, to return, to return to the God who keeps his promises, or, or better yet, beware of the subtle trajectory that brings, that begins one casual degree at a time that eventually leads you to apostasy. That would be a 
good takeaway from this book. No one wakes up one day after a rich season of body life, reading the Bible, serving, being served, and no one says, well, today I'll throw it all away. This is not how that works. That happens by small, comfortable steps. Habit-forming decisions that set a trajectory away from the life-giving, promise-keeping God of the universe. And so this verbal idea that you find in the book of Hosea to turn around, it shows up nearly 20 times in the book, and it's the Hebrew word for repentance. In, in New Testament Greek, the idea of repentance has to do with a change of the mind, the change of thinking. And in the Hebrew Old Testament, re- repentance is represented by a turning around. You can think of a U-turn. That would be appropriate. And they go together. Repentance brings a, with it a, a change of thinking that results, that results after being exposed to God's truth followed by a turn from sin towards godliness. Changing your ways without changing the way you think leads you to externalism and legalism. Knowing how to think biblically without letting your thinking affect the trajectory of your life will lead you to hypocrisy and presumption. And this is the world that Hosea lived in. Hosea lived in a generation that knew all about God. By the 730s, 740s BC, times were good, and they had uh, quite the provision. In fact, I'll just give you a list of all of the things that that God had delivered to them. They they had no shortage of God's word. They had Genesis through Deuteronomy, the book of Joshua, Job, about half of the historical writings. Hosea's generation had 110 of the 150 psalms that are recorded in your Bible. All of Solomon's literature, along with Obadiah, Jonah, Joel, and Amos. And Hosea's generation failed. They failed because they had grown unmoved by God's word, and as a result, they had become indifferent to him. Open up Hosea and look at chapter 11, verse 2. It says this, the more they, the prophets, called them Israel, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. And so the consequence that follows, you can see this in verse 5, they will not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria, he will be their king because they refuse to return to me. These are not words of indignation, but uh, tearfulness on God's part. They had become an apostate generation, and in the words of Hebrews 6, they had crossed that invisible line where it is impossible to renew this generation to repentance. Look at chapter 5, verse 4. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God, for a spirit of harlotry is within them. They had gone too deep. So God has decided to disperse them. He evicts them from the promised land. So when you think about Hosea, the date that's most closely associated with the book is 722 B.C. when Assyria raided the northern kingdom and made God's people slaves. Assyrians kept great records and they recorded the brutality of what Hosea predicts, destroying crops with salt and bringing people out with meat hooks pretty terrible. And the the tragedy of that event when Israel was evicted from the promised land is that it was foreseeable. It was predictable. Hosea's generation lived at the threshold of what Moses foresaw when he stood on Mount Nebo overlooking the Jordan Valley uh, after 40 years of wandering in the desert. God would evict Israel and some future generation. And the question is why? Well, why would they do that? If, if you're Israel with Moses and, and, and you're about to enter the promised land after wandering for 40 years, and one of the last things Moses, Moses says is, there's a generation coming that is, is going to ruin it all. 
and God will evict you from the land. It's certain. Oh, well, why would that happen? Just listen to the words of Deuteronomy 29. It will happen because, he says, they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they have not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in the book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, in fury, and with great wrath, and cast them into another land as it is this day. That's what would be said. And Hosea's generation lived in that moment. Hosea's prophecy could have started in chapter 4. I want you to look at chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, Listen to the word of the Lord, O Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. But you see, it doesn't start in in chapter 4. It starts in chapter 1. There's three chapters that precede the case that God has against Israel. And this is where Hosea's unique contribution comes into play in your Bible. See, apostasy from the gospel of God is not just a cold, emotionless case against those who know better. Apostasy is heartbreaking for him. So if your understanding of God's sovereignty comes at the expense of understanding how he feels about the trajectory of your life, then Hosea's contribution will be a great study for you. It will be rich. Let's investigate how we see that in Hosea's commission. You can open up and look at chapters 1 through 3, and we'll just pick at, pick at a few of these uh, passages. Hosea was a double-duty prophet. He had the unenviable task of being a living illustration of the message that he preached. God says, okay, it's time to walk a mile in my shoes and show everyone what it's like when my people who I love reject me. And what's the best relationship to convey what kind of heartbreak God feels? Well, marriage. So he says in verse 2, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go and take for yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits fragrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So Gomer, his wife, was a prostitute. And for Hosea, his life's work was to raise and lead a family that personified the relationship that God had with Israel. Hosea had three children. I'd like to look at these names, bring out their significance before we move into the indictment that begins in chapter 4. The first son is found in verse 4 of chapter 1. The Lord said to him, that's Hosea, name him Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu, that was the dynasty that was in place, for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And then, of course, you see what happens in chapter 10. You can stay there, but I'll just read to you in chapter 10 at the end of the chapter. uh, We see something similar. It says, at dawn, the king of Israel will be completely cut off. So God is putting an end to this kingdom. And Hosea is the, the messenger that delivers that message. It's appropriate to think of the seed promise when you think about the word Jezreel. Jezreel is a cognate of the Hebrew word for seed, and it means God will sow. God will sow. That's what Jezreel means. And and so when you think about uh, the the continuity of Scripture, it's appropriate to, to see a promise right off the bat from our loving God to say God will sow in the spite of ending this kingdom from which the line is supposed to come. Now, Judah in the south is where the line would come from, but God would take them into exile as well. So these are promises that the faithful could bank on in spite of everything they saw around them. Next child is a daughter, Lo Ruhamah. Lo Ruhamah is found in verse 6. Then she, Gomer, conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. Oruhamah means no compassion. Israel had developed political alliances and and economic dependencies on other nations, and God calls it infidelity. 
because they were supposed to depend on him and him alone. Third child is low on me, not my people. Not my people. You remember when God created man, he created them in his image and according to his likeness. In his image so that he could walk with him and according to his likeness so that everything about man would represent something about God's character. And it should have been true that in God's called out people, even in a fallen world, that you would learn something about God and what he's like by observing them. But look what characterizes the generation Hosea was a part of. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, There is swearing and deception, murder and stealing, and adultery, and they employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Those aren't characteristics from God. It would have been an offense for a presumptuous generation to, to hear Hosea name his youngest, not my people, But God's people are characterized by repentance and turning to him, not presuming on him. So, not my people because nothing about them represented God. No compassion because God would let them walk in the consequences of their sin. And Jezreel because in spite of Israel's sin, he would not cancel his promises. Look at chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. So even though all this is coming down on Israel, he says this, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it says, You are not my people, it will be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. That sounds like an Abrahamic promise. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. They were not at this point. And they will appoint for themselves one leader, and they will go up from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. But those promises wouldn't come to pass for a long time. The regathering and appointment of one messianic leader remains outstanding. And for the present time, their experience would be much different. God's done with Hosea's generation, so how will this relationship play out? Go ahead and look at uh, chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. This is... This would be the experience of Israel for that intermediate period. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her her lovers. She will not overtake them, and she will seek them but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. What would it be like between then and now? Look at verse 10. God says, I will cover uncover her lewdness. He would expose their shame. Verse 11, I would also put an end to all her gaiety. All the feasts would be over. Verse 12, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees. Verse 13, I will punish her for the days of the bales. Nevertheless, there would be a future day that God delivers on his redemptive promises. Look at verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me Ishi, that means husband, and you will no no longer call me Bali, master. They had their, they, they completely missed the relationship they were meant to have with their God. And if, if you, like Israel, see the God of the Bible as a taskmaster for morality and nothing more than than you don't have a relationship with him. You don't know him as he was meant to be known. This This is what presumption led them to. God would change all that in a future time. But it would be a while. Look at chapter 3. In 14 chapters in the book of Hosea, there are all of 14 verses on Hosea's biography. Over my, the heading over chapter 3 in my Bible says Hosea's second marriage. It's a little bit misleading. This was not a remarriage this, or a second marriage, second person anyway. It says this, 
And then the Lord said to me, go, go, to, go again and love a woman who is loved by her husband, that's Hosea, yet an adulteress, even, even as the lo- Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought her for myself for 50 shekels, 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. So Hosea, after he finds his wife who had flew the coop and wound up in adultery again, prostitution, goes to the slave market and he demonstrates the kind of love that God demonstrates to every sinner. And he buys her, redeems her, buys him buys her for himself. It's so undeserved. And what's with those units of measure anyway? Well, you only start bartering with perishables when you run out of silver. This was expensive. This was all the change that Hosea had in his pocket. The redemption of man is, is not a cheap thing. This was an expensive illustration. And so here, this is how he deals with her. Verse 3, Then I said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man, so I will be towards you. So that relationship is going to be in a holding pattern. Verse 4, For the sons of Israel, this is why, will remain for many days without king or prince or sacrifice or sacred pillar and without ephod or household idol. Many days, Israel would be in a holding pattern. And this is a technical term in prophecy to, that means a long time. God would remove their provision of leadership and worship by noting all, the, all these things they will not have access to. Three of them are good and prescribed by the law, and three of them were introductions by idolatry from other nations. Nevertheless, the northern kingdom in particular would be entering a spiritual wasteland, and Judah would follow them later. So for a long time, Israel would remain distinctly Hebrew, yet unable to worship as their God prescribes. And that's a work of God, and I find it fascinating, because in any other society, the religion that defines those societies rise and fall with the people who invent them. Why don't we have a Roman cult religion anymore? Why well, society's gone? It was dispersed. It's something else now. What about the Greek gods or the Aztecs? Well, they're irrelevant and mythological because those societies ended, and when they ended, so did the religions that they supported. But God's intentions are not upheld by any man or society of men And God is not done with the ethnic people of Israel. He has outstanding promises to them. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? And he goes on to say, don't be wise in your own estimation. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So all of Israel will be saved. What will that look like? Look down again at chapter 3, verse 5. Afterwards, the sons of Israel will return, there's our word again, for repentance, and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and his goodness in the last days. So in Hosea's biography, there is a specific message to Israel, and that is that they will be restored despite what God is bringing to them. Hosea's biography begins with the end of a kingdom that failed and ends with directing your attention to the eschatological promises of God for a kingdom that will never end. But for the time being, God has a contention with Israel. God's case against Israel is what I call in Hosea, as you read it, an autopsy on an apostate generation. 
an autopsy on apostate generation. And, and, a, and apostasy is, is not simply unbelief, right? It's not simply unaware, ignorant, unbelief. Apostasy is more than that. It begins by being enlightened by God's word, tasting truth, and eventually rejecting that truth with your life. And so if you want to discover, as you're studying this book, the comfortable incremental trajectory changes that will lead you to apostasy, take a slow read of chapters 4 through 10. It's a great opportunity to do some self-evaluation. The autopsy continues past chapter 10 through chapter 14, but in chapter 11 there's a milestone where, in the book, where God's promises for Israel's restoration begin. But up until that point, there's a lot we can learn about the inclination of the heart of man. And let's begin by looking at chapter 4, verse 6. This is, this is the autopsy. So we're doing an autopsy now, and we're looking in this, this dead generation, and we're saying, how did this happen? Here's what happened. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Of course, the lack of knowledge here isn't some shortage of intellect. This was an exchange for of temporary pursuits and fleeting comforts for at the expense of knowing the Creator Himself. And it's no surprise that a lifestyle that elevates Living in the moment over eternal realities keep you from knowing God. And they were forewarned about this. Let me read to you what Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 14 says. You don't have to turn there. Moses says, Beware that you, Israel, do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you this day. Otherwise, when you have eaten... Follow this train of thought and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiplies and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And so the question is, are you capable of that? I am. Look at, turn to chapter 13 and read verse 6. There are no surprises here. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Verse 6, let's start with verse 5. I cared for you in the wilderness, God says, in the land of drought. And as they had their pasture, they became satisfied. And being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. These are predictable outcomes. The heart of man is wired to wander. That's why Paul says, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of what? Knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So they had forgotten God. That, that, is, that is the first thing you find in this autopsy. They had forgotten God. The second thing we find in the autopsy is Derelict duty of the teachers. Derelict duty of the teachers. Look at chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. It says this. They, the priests, feed on the sin of my people and direct their, the people's, desires toward their iniquity. Well, that's not what priests are supposed to do. That's not what the heralds of the gospel are supposed to do. And Paul tells Timothy that in the last days, people will accumulate teachers for themselves according to their own liking, ones that will tell them what they want to hear. Beware when you see that because you've already, ha- you've already seen the autopsy of this generation, this dead generation who presumed on the same God. Verses, verse 4, 8 takes up the same phenomenon from a different vantage point, the vantage point of the teacher, rather than the people's saying the teachers fed them what they wanted to hear. So the, uh, the derelict duty of the teachers, 
And of course, you see that they are held accountable first and foremost. Look at chapter 5, the first verse. Hear this, O priest. Give heed, O house of Israel. Listen, to the house of the, listen, O house of the king, for this judgment applies to you. For you have been a snare. It's not what the teachers of God are supposed to be. And so they're the first ones that are called out. Derelict duty of the teachers. Third, third thing we're going to find in the autopsy in these ten chapters is what it looks like when you forget your Bible. And, and I don't mean what I did on Tuesday. I'm a seminary student. I've been, I've been going to seminary for five years. And I think maybe three times I forgot my Bible. On Tuesday, I forgot my Bible. But I wasn't afraid. Bibles are easy to find around here. But, but when, when I'm talking about when you leave your Bible on the shelf and you become distanced from God's Word and less familiar with what is in it. Look at what the lack of familiarity with your Bible does to a wandering heart. What happens when you forget your Bible? Look at chapter 8, verse 12. God says, Though I wrote for him, that's Israel, 10,000 precepts of my law, they regarded it as a strange thing. A strange thing. I don't know if you've ever had the experience uh, as a believer, if you've been walking with the Lord for some time. I've been a believer for about 20 years. And, and I've had the experience in the last maybe 10 or less than that where, where I look back and, and I see people who were so well-versed in the Word. And by God's grace, they were an influence in my life. And then you circle back with those relationships later and, and you can just tell there's some disconnect. There's a, an unfamiliarity with that which was once familiar. It's heartbreaking. But but let that be a sign to never become unfamiliar with what is in God's Word. Because that is one degree that the trajectory of your life can take that will put distance between you and the living God. Unfamiliarity with your Bible. The precision of God's Word becomes a strange thing and discernment becomes misguided. That's what happens when you become unfamiliar with your Bible. And this is a real danger because God's Word is the only thing that can judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. So stay familiar with your Bible, not, not just the concepts in the Bible. That, that is actually the first step in becoming unfamiliar with your Bible is to depend on concepts that float over your Bible and depend on the platitudes that perhaps come from your Bible until you are having trouble grounding yourself in why you believe what you believe because you've put distance between yourself and the text. Don't do that. So not only do you become less discerning, but you forget where discernment comes from. I just want you to point out the comparative language in Chapter 10, verse 1 and 14, 8. So look at, uh, turn to chapter 10. Verse 1 says this, Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. But then it kind of feels like it takes a turn because it says, the more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. Those are bad things, right? So, so what's going on there? Well, if you look, if in, in my Bible, there's a, a footnote on this word luxuriant. Israel has become a luxuriant vine. The, the word means degenerate. Israel has become a degenerate vine. So luxuriant, sure, in the, in, in, in the way that it would spread out quickly and become very visible, large, sure, luxuriant. But, but degenerate, it's the kind of vine that, that grows around the tree, depends on the tree, but actually chokes out the light from the tree and consumes all of its resources until there is no longer support for the vine, and they both go down. And the vine dies. Of course, the vine is oblivious to this death, and it comes by surprise. Uh, 
that's how God depicts his people who have forgotten him and become unfamiliar with his word. In contrast, turn to chapter 14, verse 8. This is at the very end of the book. After all these promises are conveyed, he uses this word luxuriant one more time. It's a different Hebrew word. Right there in the middle of the verse, it says, I, God, am a luxuriant cypress. From me comes your fruit. Oh, I should mention that that verse starts with O Ephraim. And so, as you read through the book of Hosea, you, you see God keeps referring to Israel as Ephraim. Okay? Uh, the word Ephraim means fruitful. It first shows up in Genesis when Joseph names his second son Ephraim, saying, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. And so later, Ephraim became synonymous with the northern tribes of Israel who Hosea is preaching to. His point is that they have lost sight of the fact that God himself is the true source of fruitfulness. All the human flourishing that they are after, God is the true source of those things. God is the source of lasting fruitfulness. There are more details, more details to see in this autopsy on an apostate generation, but I do want to cover what genuine repentance looks like. Genuine repentance. You can stay in chapter 14. When you think about what repentance looks like, what it takes, what it feels like, as a Christian, it can seem elusive, can't it? You can deal with a sin and think you're dealing with it rightly and then some other version of that same thing pops up over here, trading one desire for another. And you just want it to go away. Well, the Bible outlines in so many places what true repentance looks like. Hosea 14 is one of those places. Chapter 14 begins like this. It's an exhortation from Hosea to the generation that he's preaching to. Return! Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Of course, this word stumble, this isn't the, the word for tripping over a crack in the sidewalk, right? This is, this is a word that means the ground gave way underneath you as you were walking on the edge of the Grand Canyon because for some reason you thought that would be a good idea. And, and you know, praise God for not showing us where that line is, Right? Where that line is where if we cross it, if we finally are faithless for so long, we can no longer come to repentance. You know why? Because then we would walk up against that line. We'd walk on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I hope not. So he says, you've stumbled because of your iniquity. Hosea says this, I'm going to make this dummy proof for you. Verse 2, take words with you. And return, there's that word again, to the Lord. Say to him, number one, take away all our iniquity. Take away all of our iniquity. He says, here's your script. And, and it's remarkable that when someone's trajectory remains unchanged for so long, that they eventually will even forget how to repent. And it begins by an admission of sin, acknowledging your guilt. And so that's what happens in verse 2. Say to him, take away our iniquity. And then in humility, receive us graciously. We don't deserve to be received, but would you please <laughs> receive us graciously? What would follow that? That we would present the fruit of our lips. And this is a little idiomatic, but the idea here is that we would make complete the fruit of our lips. What's that sound like? Well, I want to do the things that I say I'm going to do because talk's cheap. Repentance is, is, is the full deal. It's, it's not just words. It's actually turning from sin. Help us do that. It's followed by specificity on sin. Hosea's, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Israel's uh, sins were that they had made a political alliances they had depended on military strength, and they had chased after idolatry. And so they say, Assyria cannot save us. 
We will not ride on horses. There's that reference to their, to their dependence on their military strength. Nor will we say again, our God, to the work of our hands. And so there is this appeal for mercy after, a, after specificity on the sin that they've committed. And look how verse 3 ends. This is notable. For in you, Lord, the orphan finds mercy. The orphan. That's interesting because these are the people of God. This is a, this is a change of the mind. We're not presuming on God any longer. We're considering ourselves orphans. What comes to mind is at, uh, the, at John's baptism when he looks at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they said, don't just think, hey, we have Abraham. We're good. And John didn't, John didn't have omniscience. He didn't know what they were thinking, but that was their MO. Everybody knew that. They, they banked on just being a son of Abraham. And yet Hosea's outline, Hosea's roadmap says, consider yourself an orphan. You don't, you don't deserve to be saved. This is how you walk in repentance. Eventually, for Israel specifically, God has promises for them. Look how he responds in verse 4. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. And then he says, I will be like the dew to Israel. He, Israel, will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. It's an interesting phrase. He will take root. And um, the, the idea here of taking root uh, means the, it, it actually kind of sounds funny English, in English. The, the root will strike into the rocks. Now, 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 hold on a minute. Roots grow slowly, and they're very difficult to remove. But when, when God heals their apostasy, Israel's apostasy, he, he uses this description of striking the root and using a word that would mean like to strike a javelin into a target or to drive a stake into the ground. And he says they will be firmly established in a moment. When Christ returns and heals their apostasy, Israel will be firmly established. God's a God who keeps his promises. And he keeps his promises to you. He's promised to complete the good work that he started in you, believer, on the day of Christ. So, so why would we want to wander from that? We don't want to wander from that kind of God. A God who models a love that endures offense. We're out of time, but I, I have a couple of resources I just want to give to you. Um, if, if you want to have a companion for this book of Hosea, which is just so rich, uh, my, my favorite commentary on this book is Love Beyond Degree by George Zemeck and the late George Zemeck and Todd Murray. Wonderful book. Uh, Zemeck's footnotes just make it really wonderful to read through. So you can use this to get more familiar with the book of Hosea. It, if, if you're just saying to yourself, I, I, I need a roadmap for repentance. There's just something that I need to deal with. Um, I will uh, forward uh, this document, which is uh, called The Marks of True Repentance. This is by Brian Arnold. He's a pastor in the TES network. And he has outlined from 2 Corinthians 7 what true repentance is, and then given some questions and uh, worksheet answers that you can work your way through so you can give it some application in your own life. I'll make sure that the girls up front have that if you want to look into it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this book of Hosea. Uh, barely scratched the surface of all that it has contained in it. I pray that you would protect us from those small, incremental, comfortable degree changes in the trajectory of our lives so that we would never put distance between the God of the universe, you, and, and the believer, us. Lord, I pray that our trajectory would only grow, grow us closer to you, that if it's not going to heaven with us, we would mortify it, and that we, we would stand complete before you on the day of Christ. We love you. It's in Christ, his name we pray. Amen.